a former member of the Canadian Armed Forces, has come forward with allegations of financial fraud within the military. Kirk Reese claims that during his service with the Rangers in Lac La Ranch, Saskatchewan, he was underpaid for equipment usage, compelled to sign blank sheets, and faced unprecedented reprisal for attempting to report corruption. In my commitment to balanced and honest journalism, I reached out to the Canadian Armed Forces regarding these allegations but did not receive a response. Additionally, inquiries made to the RCMP and the Office of the Public Sector Integrity Commissioner for comment were declined. Kirk has amassed thousands of audio recordings and hundreds of pages documenting his experience. However, as the parties he accuses have not addressed these allegations, it is important to note that the following content comprises allegations we have been unable to confirm independently. Here's Kirk's side of the story. Like, I picked this place because it was very remote. There's lots of food sources, there's lots of water sources. It's hard to get to. There's only like 60 people that live on this island. Hey, Boyne, how's it going? Good. Like I said, I had $1,000 when I left Saskatchewan. I had to find a place where I knew I could make a living. And my friend told me, Kirk, if you came here, you wouldn't have a problem because everyone needs skills like yours. So I came here and that's exactly how it was. You know, they needed people like me. What's going on? Here, you have to be invited. You can't just show up and, and move. Give me a quick rundown of what your story is about. Oh, I tried to report fraud and corruption involving a band chief, and she's also a liberal nominee, and also in the military. It involves Trudeau, several politicians, and uh, millions of dollars. Okay, so what did you try to report to? Everybody, the Independent Disclosure Office, Public Integrity Commissioner of Canada, Auditor General, Julie Raybald, 50 other politicians, 100 other RCMP. Nobody will touch it. I was a master electrician. I used to run hotels and bars and stuff like that. I ended up going into trade school and I got my journeyman's ticket. I worked through the union. I was taught by very focused, very well-trained individuals. A lot of guys, they just get their trades by pulling cable or what have you. But I said, I'm not one of those cable puller guys. And they said, oh, you're one of those. So they taught me everything. So there's a strange story, but this is where the Rangers first started. Really? <laughs> yeah. So there's the plaques. There's a crash to Canso somewhere over here. RCF station and the story of the men that lost their lives, World War II. Uh, yeah, no, I just wanted it to be known that it, I was always successful, I always worked hard, I always had lots of work, you know, I went to trade school, I did well, I never relied on anybody, you know, I had it pretty much made. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw an advertisement in the newspaper, when they used to have a newspaper in the ranch, uh, joining the Rangers, and it sounded like a pretty good uh, shoe, shoe in fit for myself and my father, so. I went down and checked it out, and basically it was a win-win because we they were asking for people that knew the area and that uh, had survival skills and could teach. I had quads, sleds, boats. You know, my dad had planes and stuff. Plus, he was we've been outdoors men for all our lives. He taught me a lot. So same with my grandfather, Walter, who used to be a resource officer. But uh, yeah, I joined the first day. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Good one! <laughs> now I know why we brought you. <laughs> Pretty good gig. They said they'd pay us $100 a day for a truck or a quad or a boat usage. And we're like, oh, we actually get paid to do this? <laughs> so that's awesome. Perfect day, not too hot, not too cold. <laughs> and then they said you get a wage, certain wage, which is like minimal. Like what I used to make an hour, I used to make in a day, but whatever, we weren't. My dad didn't join it for the money. He's very well off and I didn't join it for the money. And you know, it was good to give back to our community and Canada. I didn't know it was gonna end up like this. <laughs> I noticed they were using cash payments. I'm like, oh, I don't like cash payments because you know, that's too open to fraud. 2012, 2013 is when I really noticed 
like the non-government type of invoicing and stuff they were doing. It was like my kid could have drawn up a better, a better uh, invoice, which I'll show you later. But <coughs> either way, I didn't think much about it because you know who might have complained. But uh, I asked for a T4, and they said, "Well, we don't get them." I'm like, "That's kind of odd, but okay, it's the government, I guess. You know, the government pays you. It's like peace work or something like that. Police officers maybe don't get them. It's, I don't know." It wasn't about the money anyways, so... Well, in 2019, I found out that we were supposed to be getting $200 a day for a quad or a truck or a, 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 the boats, they go by size, but uh, we were getting paid half of what we were supposed to be when we started. Either way, I complained to my about uh, unwanted sexual advances towards a civilian to my patrol commander, and she said, well, yeah, no, every, everyone knows that, but I said, that's not how it works. You, 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 you put a stop to it. <laughs> and she wasn't interested in doing that. So. Kirk says that the officer he complained about was the same officer who would decide who gets paid what. Responsible for seeing who gets paid what, you know, because it's always a crapshoot what you're going to get paid. You don't know if you're, if you're going to get paid, but you always sign a blank sheet. And then after the fact, you'll fill in, or they'll fill in how much you get paid, and then you just get cash. And you're like, thank you, you know, because I didn't care about the money. It sure come in handy sometimes, because after they... But, after I complained, by some reason, they seized all my accounts. <laughs> and I thought that was coincidental, but I wasn't doing my taxes because I was getting my T4s and I was onto them so somewhat by then, but not as, I didn't think it was as big a deal as it actually turned out to be. Like, the CRA seized your account. Yeah, yeah, right, like three days after I complained. And then he also says, you're off the exercise. I was obviously on the exercises, but he lied and said I wasn't. And it, the whole town thought I was getting paid. I was like the only one that wasn't. That's okay, I said, I'll do it. Just, just help save these people's places, right? But uh, either way, he kicked me off exercises. Well, I want my, my uh, pay sheets back because I signed a bunch. And he said, sign a bunch because you won't be coming back because you're, you're in combat class and you don't have to come in and si sign pay sheets every day. So I did that and I asked him for them back. He said, no, they're, they're gone. They're already sent out. I'm like, how could they be sent out? I'm not even, I'm off the exercise, you know? I let it go. How much money did they seize? In that first uh, couple days of, I think it was, 125,000 give or take and then from between 2015 and 2019 pretty much all my ranger pay pretty much all the pay I got uh, into a total of $350,000 plus you know and they, they didn't stop until they, I was released from the military and I was you know I couldn't contract anymore so I had to try work for other people and then <clears throat> they'd try to juggle them paying me so that I didn't have to get the money seized <laughs> You know, it was just trying to survive for four years. What was the justification for seizing? I didn't do my taxes because I, I couldn't get my, my T4s. And uh, I, you know, I saw that they were stealing and I didn't want to be part of that and contribute to the same people that are stealing, you know, like it's against principles. Then he got his wife involved and his daughter involved and their friends involved. And none of these guys had any skills whatsoever. You know, a few of them, like his wife could trap rabbits and stuff like that. But, I was like, why are you filling our, our patrol with these people that I, I don't think they could save anybody, you know? And it became painfully obvious in the years I was gone. Are you accusing them of nepotism? Nepotism is the word for it, yeah. 2018, I filed a complaint with the uh, RCMP. Uh, Russell Morasti, you know, I told him the story about the fraud and stuff. And he said, you have to file a complaint with the RCMP. Uh, F division because he used to be the soup the top cop for Saskatchewan and I'd have coffee with him every couple days in the motor in right and he was I actually tried to get him into the Rangers so I could get him to get involved with this this but he went so either way I phoned the F division and that's when my life turned upside down because I told my patrol commanders like I contacted uh, the ombudsman I think they were thinking military ombudsman but it was actually the RCMP ombudsman because I tried to report the corruption to them and a bunch of other things but uh Either way, they suspended me for a year. October 15th, 2018, I believe it was. And I'm like, they took away my guns, said I, I was unstable. And like, because I made a formal complaint, you know. What's the um, time distance between you making the complaint and them suspending you? Uh, about 10 minutes. Really? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it happened. Uh, yeah, like when I told them about the complaint, yeah, well, I, was, I, I noticed right away things turned right around and uh, 
you know, if I went from one week hauling 10,000 rounds of military bullets in my personal truck, you know, I was authorized to carry that to not being able to have a gun. You know, <laughs> a lot of guys said, what the hell is going on here? But they didn't know my whole story, right? Like, like Jim asked me when they, when they called me to that office and I told the warrant officer or the sergeant major, like, I, I don't like this signing blank sheets and stuff. And he's, who's complaining? And he's like, well, I am. And he's, well, here's $4,000. Here's your pay for this exercise. And I, I thought, well, that's too much, you know, but you know, I, I didn't have the paperwork in front of me because I did a lot of work. And then, uh, then he sends me a message. This mess, this, this money is between you and me, not public knowledge. I'm like, what? You're just admitting it's not public knowledge. Wow. You know, he says more direct deposit to come. Well, I found out later, uh, when they did pay me for that, they sent me another 25 or $2,300. That's in my pay sheets there. Kirk says his suspension was dismissed by a superior officer, but he was denied his position nonetheless by the lesser ranking officer whom he complained about. He posted like a few hours later, we have a position of Kirk, Kirk, Kirk's position is now open. Warren officer said, you're back in your position as, as to a, a patrol or section leader. Back in, and I said, I have to be in charge of my section in case there's an emergency. Like, we have to have this figured out, you know, command. chain of command, right? And they wouldn't respond. His response was, we're going to have an election to get Kirk out. No response to me. I'm like, what the hell is going on here, you know? And then i like, this is career ending. Yeah. You know, this is going to ruin his life if this ever got out. He came up to me, he said, Kirk, you're going to have to quit. Mm. And I was going to quit. Until he said, you have to quit, or we're going to get you a Section F, 5F, which is dishonorable release. And he says, you'll never be able to work for the government again. As I, I couldn't give a f if I work for the government again. I can't work for a corrupt c company, right? And he was very distraught. He was like pretty much crying. It's Kirk, think of your babies. Think you've stepped on too many toes. Like, think of your children. Think of your babies. Come on. Veiled threats? Veiled threats, yep. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. I'm getting these messages from like majors and black captains and lieutenant colonels and I'm like who the hell are these people you know coming after me all of a sudden saying you can't go on Facebook you can't contact the military ombudsman which is against every rule in the book like that's who you're supposed to contact and he says I, I recommend not going public don't contact the ombudsman things never end well for anybody well they didn't end well for me that's for sure uh, it was originally a lighthouse in Halifax Coast Guard Lighthouse, so it's built like a brick shit house, so to speak. Made for the toughest storms. And then from what I gathered, it was turned into a yacht by the Eagles Rock Band and spent about 30 years in the Caribbean where if, if those walls could talk, I'm sure they'd have some good stories. The owner passed away in 2013, so they mothballed it. And it sat in Campbell River for, for, for I think nine years. And then I saw it was for sale I don't know, by some miracle there, they, they dropped their price a quarter of a million dollars and I was able to cash out my civilian pension. And uh, when I paid for it in cash, I had $235 left. <laughs> I always wondered what these people do, how they all uprooted these boats. Maybe all their stories are like mine. <laughs> you never know. Kirk says he was arrested for knowing too much after RCMP found out his location. Before that, I talked to Igmar. I said, look, at some point in time, I'm going to get arrested and taken away and I might not come back. You have to promise me to look after Kenneth. And what was the reason for the arrest? Because I know too much. And I went from there to the hospital to tell them I'm not suicide or homicide. Uh, Bella Bella Hospital. Yeah. And of course, I'm recording everything, right? <coughs> and. Uh, I said, I'm not homicidal or suicidal. I, you know, I have no dependencies, nothing's wrong with me. I just have this crazy story and it sounds crazy. So they phoned the police. Police came and arrested me under the Mental Health Act, <laughs> which is fine. Because they said, well, you'll get arrested. You'll go to Vancouver and you can deal with your story there. I'm like, perfect. It's going to get done. Finally, someone's going to listen. <clears throat> well, I go to tell my story and I can tell the guy's not listening to anything. I just sound like a crazy person. So I was like, whatever. You know, he didn't even make a, didn't even make a file, I don't think. So they put me in a straitjacket and then they said, okay, we're going to medicate you unconscious now. I'm like, no, and like, we're going to. <laughs> so they did. 
And I woke up two days later in a mental hospital in Vancouver. And a doctor saw me for five minutes. He says, do you think there's a conspiracy out to get you? I'm like, yep. And he says, you're paranoid, you know, you're, uh, you have a drug dependency. They talk to my patrol commanders and stuff. <laughs> you're addicted. To yeah, the same people I reported, they said I have drug addictions, alcohol addictions, anger problems. <laughs> and I'm like, of course I didn't know that then because I didn't see the, until the Freedom of Information Act, I saw this stuff. <coughs> so either way, I'm waiting to talk to a doctor for a week and they, they keep saying I have to take these drugs. I'm like, I'm not taking these antipsychotic drugs because I'm not psychotic. Well, Kirk, you think the army's out to get you? I'm like, well, I can prove it. Either way, these people are walking around with these ear, earbuds and stuff or and they're little music, little music players, and I'm like, can I have my uh, my uh, my ear pods or whatever they are? They're in my my briefcase with my battery charger, and then they yeah. So they bring it to me. Well, I should have had it here, but they're actually recording devices. So I put it inside here, and I recorded everything. I recorded the nurses saying, "I'm never going to get out of there unless I start keep taking these drugs. They can keep me there forever." Kirk has thousands of audio recordings ranging from his phone calls with the authorities to his time in the hospital throughout his ordeal. So they say, Kirk, uh, do you want a day pass, like a four hour day pass? So I'm like, sure. So I get a day pass and I'm walking around Vancouver and I see a liberal nomination office. I walk in there and I says, I'd like to make a report or, or talk to the boss and the boss is in there, whoever that was. <clears throat> She's not here. What do you want to talk about? I was like, We're, I want to send you uh, an email. So I sent her a few emails. What's this about? You know, and I tell her, I was like, I'm reporting the corruption. Trudeau's got a liberal band uh, chief who's running as liberal nominee, and she's fraudulent. You know, I, I want him to know that he's got, got someone that's committing fraud in the military. And uh, I get on ferry, and the, RC, the RCMP, Vancouver RCMP, fooled me. I'm like, Were you at a nom nomination office yesterday? I'm like, Yep. Yeah. Did you threaten anybody like that? I can't remember exactly the wording, but I said, yeah, well, I threatened to ruin political careers if this got out. Either way, it's all recorded. Then they, we get off the, the ferry, we go to the Esquimalt military police. I want to do my interview. They do an interview. I was like, do you want to take copies of these recordings? And they're like, nope. <laughs> I'm like, what? They, you know, it's all here. No. And he, I talk about the sexual advances and stuff like that. And he says, can you prove it? Well, no, I can't. He says, just talk about what you can prove. I was like, well, here, no, wouldn't take it. Meanwhile, the captain locked the keys in the car. <laughs> so I had to phone a friend of mine in the army and he knows them. And he came and he gave us a ride, me a ride to the hotel. And they said, we'll meet you at the bar and we'll have some supper and we'll get, give you a release paper, sir. I'm like, okay, as long as it's not 5F. <coughs> I meet them there, they buy me a few drinks, and the, which is funny because I'm supposed to be an alcoholic and <laughs> all that stuff. And it's all recorded. The recorder was running in my shirt. And they said, well, you have to sign this 5F. I'm like, I'm not signing a 5F release, you know. Well, we'll sign it for you, whatever. You know, so that's what I was released at. They gave me $50 to catch the, a, a cab to the airport the next day, which you I did. They did. <laughs> Aren't you required to? I, I'm required to have a closeout meeting to make sure all of my documentations are accurate, all of my stuff are accurate, uh, my payroll's up to date, my plans of getting back in society are all good. It's all mandatory in the military to do this stuff, except for me. <laughs> You're saying they, didn't <laughs> they, they didn't do anything. Yeah. Oh, they took me to a clinic or a hospital, and the guy says, like, Do you think? I'm like, I can prove it. He said, oh, you're from the Ranj? I'm like, yeah. He said, oh, I know Dr. So-and-so. I'm like, oh, what a coincidence. Hey, me too. We went to doctors together. I'm like, So he, he wrote there that I'm unsuitable to operate a machinery, military machinery, guns, or command people because I did my job of reporting corruption. And that was the medical release. And that's the first medical release in the history of the Canadian Rangers since 1947. And uh, I have... Letters from Trudeau, I have letters from Harjit, their assistants, you know, saying they're going to investigate this or it's not their problem. I have letters from Joe Friday, the Public Integrity of Commissioner of Canada, who admits to reprisal of me, but he says, I'm the Public public Integrity Commissioner. Well, I have a letter here saying that that's the ones that are supposed to investigate it. You know, right here, for example. Your situation is beyond the mandate 
or fall under the purview of the Canadian Human Rights Act and would be better dealt under the Public Service Disclosure Protection Act. And this is the Canadian Human Rights Commission, you know. So they say that Joe Friday is supposed to look after this and they just go back and forth and nobody's looking after it. So everybody's pointing the finger to somebody else. Yeah, no one has the balls to take this evidence, you know, except you and Bob, you know, and Bob, Bob Leon. Yeah, and that's what they even say. Uh, they're being well. It's because you're deemed as crazy. <laughs> that's what they say in their reports. Nothing you say is true because you went to a mental hospital. It's good for you guys. I recorded them too. You know, I have, I have recordings of the RCMP coming in here, saying they can't. They'll, they'll take my evidence, but they can't investigate. You know, like what? What is your job then, coward? You know, like who's who? If my son needed help, who who would he run to? I would say anybody but the RCMP at this moment, you know, anyone, anybody except a government official. While we have made every effort to present a balanced perspective, the lack of response from the Canadian Armed Forces, the RCMP and the Office of the Public Sector Integrity Commissioner leaves critical questions unanswered. We will continue to seek clarity and follow up on this story as more information becomes available. The pursuit of truth and accountability remains at the forefront of our journalistic endeavors. If you would like to support me in this journey, please consider donating at mediabizergan.com slash donate. Thank you.